Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the podcast, I want to talk about Bitcoin ETFs. Bitcoin ETFs are here. They are producing a lot of questions. Regulators have been reluctant to approve them for some time for a lot of very good reasons, I think. And I wanted to cover all this on the podcast because for a lot of mainstream investors, these might appear to be a very interesting way to invest in Bitcoin in your brokerage account without having to fumble with one of these digital wallets or alternative platforms that are confusing and scary and potentially uh, risky from a security standpoint. I cover this in this de- in this episode in detail. These things give me a lot of pause. Please think twice before you buy one of these ETFs. I think they could be a good fit for short, really short-term traders, but they're backed by futures contracts, which is a completely different animal. At any rate, this has been in the news. A lot of people are asking about it, and I thought it might be a great topic for this week's episode. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everybody. Real quick before we jump into today's episode, I have been advised by my attorneys to remind you all that none of what you might hear in today or any other episode of Grow Money Business is financial, investing, tax, legal, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and deploy on your own terms. And before you take any actions on what we might cover in the show, I really encourage you to consult with your accountant, attorney, or financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner and think that you might need one, be sure to check out threeoakswealth.com to learn more about my firm's planning, advice, and investment services. All righty. So this week on the podcast, I'd like to cover a topic that you may have heard about in the news over the last couple of weeks. You probably definitely have if you're a cryptocurrency enthusiast, if you're someone who just follows the markets, reads headlines, reads the Wall Street Journal, or watches a little bit of financial media here and there, you've probably heard about this too. And what I'm getting at here is Bitcoin ETFs have just recently come to market. And I want to dive into them this week because by and large, for most anybody who wants to invest in cryptocurrency, I think they're a really bad idea. (laughs) So this week on the podcast, I want to explain how these things work and why I think that. But before we do that, let's let's back up a little bit and just start this with some foundational background and context. And that's that, you know, cryptocurrency has has really uh, grown in popularity in a huge way over the last couple of years. And like I've talked about on the podcast before, I think the possibilities for this, the applications of this kind of thing, this digital currency are really uh, pretty exciting. I don't think that it's going to displace the US dollar or the Japanese yen or any of the world's reserve currencies anytime soon, but it can do some pretty cool stuff and is a more efficient way to transact than uh, what we currently do in the banking system here in the US and around the world. So because there's been so much attention around these things, if you're an investment manager who manages mutual funds or sponsors and managers exchange-traded funds, ETFs, over the last decade or so, if there's any kind of investor attention and opportunity to cobble together securities in a way that uh, would be attractive to any other investor, there's money in it for you. And, and, and you take the uh, example of the S&P 500 index fund, before there were any index mutual funds or index ETFs or any of that stuff, if you're an investor and you just want to invest in every company in the index, you have to go buy at least a share of every single company. And that's really inefficient from a cost perspective for, for most investors who don't have more than three or four or five million dollars. So now fast forward to today, there are all sorts of these ETFs that follow different markets and different sectors and different styles of investing and different factors. There is an ETF for everything because there are a lot of different investors out there and they can really be produced in a pretty effective and cost efficient way. So since cryptocurrency has been in vogue here over the last couple of years, 
these investment managers have been watching very, very closely and trying to figure out how they can bring one of these mainstream investment vehicles to market in a way that invests directly in cryptocurrency. And there are a lot of challenges to that. Um, Number one, you have the SEC who regulates these things and approves or denies applications for new mutual funds and new ETFs. And as you can imagine, they've been reluctant to approve new investment funds investing directly in cryptocurrency. But it's not simply because they think that cryptocurrency could be volatile. It's mostly because that there's this trust and custody issue that comes from purchasing any kind of cryptocurrency. So if you or I wanted to buy a Bitcoin or uh, or, or Dogecoin or Ethereum or any other type of cryptocurrency, we have to create what's called a digital wallet. And basically the way that you do that is you go to any one of these providers. There are a ton of them out, uh, out there these days, FTX, Coinbase, Coindesk. You open an account there, you put some money into an account, and they create this digital wallet that's the vehicle that stores the string of code that is your cryptocurrency that you might buy over this market. And it's secure in that the code lives in this wallet, but if anybody else gets the password to it, they can take that from you and it's gone forever. You can lose the password to it. And you hear all these stories about people who have really lucrative, um, uh, highly valued digital wallets that they just can't remember the passwords to. And if you can't remember the password, you can't access the code and the asset is basically gone. So if you're an investment manager and you want to bring to market one of these mutual funds or ETFs that invests in Bitcoin, then you have to figure out how to hold these things in custody on behalf of the holders of the fund. And that's no small task. And for any of these reasons that I just mentioned, you can lose the password to it. It can be stolen. The SEC hasn't approved any of those investment vehicles yet. And I know that there are a bunch of investment managers clamoring to bring one of these things to market. They just haven't solved for how do we hold this thing in a trustworthy place where we know it's not going to be stolen. So if it were easy, then we'd already have direct to Bitcoin, direct to Ethereum, ETFs, mutual funds, and all sorts of different ways that we can invest in our ordinary brokerage accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, retirement accounts, whatever, in one of these mainstream vehicles that trades over an exchange. But like I say, that's not the case. And what we have, the products that have just come to market, I want to say there are maybe two or three of them now. Uh, One of them, the ticker symbol is BITO. It's an ETF that's backed by Bitcoin. But you should know that when you buy shares of BITO, the fund does not hold Bitcoins in some vault or wallet on behalf of the shareholders. That's, that's, a direct, that's a direct way to do it. If you buy an S&P 500 index fund, your shares of that fund give you the right to securities somewhere else that are held in storage. And I've, I've talked about this on the podcast in the past before too. So apologi- apologies if this is redundant. But if, if you're an ETF manager, you take a bunch of cash, you go buy all the shares, and then you and other authorized, quote unquote, authorized participants have the rights to create or destroy shares of the ETFs. You buy the underlying shares, each of the 500 companies in the S&P 500, You lock them away somewhere, and that gives you the right to go create a commensurate number of uh, shares of the ETF. And that trades over the open market. There's this arbitrage process where if the price of the ETF deviates enough from the price of the underlying securities, then that group of authorized participants, trading desks uh, on Wall Street predominantly, have the right to either buy shares of the underlying securities and create more shares of the ETFs or buy shares of the ETF on the open market and destroy them and then 
exchange them for the underlying securities and go sell those. So there's this checks and balances kind of system that maintains the value of ETFs. Well, with this Bitcoin fund, you don't have shares of Bitcoin sitting in some vault somewhere. It's created using the futures markets. And so it's a convenient workaround because you have this trust issue where um, investment managers don't really know where to turn when it comes to holding or maintaining a digital wallet with Bitcoin in it on behalf of shareholders in a way that's going to be approved by the SEC. The SEC hasn't approved anything like that yet. And so a workaround is to use the futures markets instead. And so here's, here's the difference. A, a futures contract is simply a bet with some exchange on the future price of an asset. So if you wanted to bet that Apple stock was going up, you could take some money to your brokerage firm and go buy shares of Apple. And if it goes up, the shares that you just purchased are worth more. But you could also approach me and say, hey, Grant, I want to bet you that Apple stock is going to go up by 20% over the next month. And if I took that bet, that would be another way to bet on the price of Apple going up. And if it went up, then I'd pay you. And if it went down, then you'd pay me. That's basically what the futures markets are. And so rather than taking the risk that your digital wallet is hacked or it disappears or is breached or you forget the password to it or some other nonsense, the fact that Bitcoin futures are traded over the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is uh, a, a very robust platform, it's well-regarded, the risk of that entire mercantile exchange going away is very, very low. It's backed by a lot of capital and it's a very um, public and kind of prolific entity. That gives you a lot of confidence that your futures contract will be honored. So that's basically what these Bitcoin ETFs do is they, in, they interact and buy futures contracts on a monthly basis on the price of Bitcoin one month forward. And so once a month, you know, if Bit I'm, I'm going to use a really easy example. These numbers are incorrect. If Bitcoin's trading at a hundred bucks, then you're going to bet that it goes up over the next month. And if it goes up, your futures contract returns you some money. If it goes down, then you lose a little bit of money. And so the way in reality, of course, Bitcoin today is trading between 55000 and $60,000 a coin. But the idea is that the contracts are structured in a way to reward holders of the ETF favorably when the price goes up and not so favorably when the price goes down. And if you were to graph out the performance of actual Bitcoins on the open market versus performance of the Bitcoin ETF, they would look quite a bit different. And the reason is that those futures contracts are expensive in and of themselves. If you've ever ever played craps or blackjack at the at the casino, you might be familiar with the term called VIG. That's basically the house's advantage. That's what they're that, that that's what the casino is charging you for being there, and they're distorting the odds in their favor because it's a money making machine. Well, the futures market is largely the same. It's uh, a little bit more elaborate than a casino, I would say, but they, the odds are stacked in their favor by and large. So if Bitcoin goes up 100% over a 12-month period, your Bitcoin ETF ain't going to be going up 100%. It might be going up 80 or 85 or 90% or something like that because the Bitcoin ETFs, again, are backed by these futures contracts on one-month intervals. Every single month, they have to renew the contract. Every single month, when they do renew the contract, it's costly to do so, which takes away from the return. So that's how these things are structured. Now, when you buy one of these Bitcoin ETFs in your brokerage account, whether it be a taxable account or an IRA, Roth IRA, 401k, whatever... <laughs> You'd pay a commission, perhaps, to per, if, if your broker is going to charge you a commission for buying it, just like they would any stock. Most brokerages do not impose such commissions any longer. 
but that's one source of fee that you might pay. It's maybe a couple bucks, very nominal. The fund itself is going to charge you, and this one that I mentioned, BITO, is going to, sh- going to charge you 0.95% per year of your holdings, which in the grand landscape of investment funds is um, it's not cheap by any means, but it's not the highest uh, fee fund out there either. And, and so that, that's a source of cost you need to be aware of. But the biggest source of cost does not show up on any disclosure. And that's the cost of rolling over these futures contracts every single month. And so when you hear headlines about how these Bitcoins ETF, Bitcoin ETFs are out, but they're really better for traders than they are for long-term investors, that's what they're getting at. If you're betting intraday on the price of Bitcoin and you want to do that through an ETF, that might be a reasonable way to do it. But if you hold it over longer periods of time, there are far better ways to invest in Bitcoin. And you're really better off going directly to one of these providers, creating a digital wallet of your own and holding the Bitcoin in there. And if you're concerned about being hacked or breached or forgetting the password, then you can take the code. That is exactly what your Bitcoin represents. It's just a piece of code. You take it out of the wallet, you put it on uh, like a detachable hard drive that's not connected to the internet, and you just stick it in your mattress or a safety deposit box and just keep it there. And that's another, that's a, a far more effective way to do it, um, in my opinion. So I wanted to go over that. And, and this really reminds me of levered ETFs and mutual funds as well. Um, I want, maybe five or 10 years ago, these things were very, very popular and I, they're, they're still widely used. They're a little less popular than they are, than they were a few years back. But if, if the idea is if you buy one of these things, they have these 2X or 3X levered uh, ETFs and mutual funds related to index performance out there. And I can't remember what the tickers are off the top of my head, but if you bought maybe the 2X levered S&P 500 fund, that would mean that if you put a uh, 100 bucks into one of these things and intraday, the market went up by 2%, then the value of that fund should go up by 4%. And on the other hand, if it went down by 3%, then your fund should be down by 6%. And intraday, just like these Bitcoin ETFs, these levered funds tracked those leverage amounts and they had all sorts of different leverage amounts. I think the limit that they ever approved was 3X. But... If you track them intraday, the performance of the underlying market or index that the fund was tracking compared to the performance, the actual performance of the fund, it was pretty close to uh, the amount of leverage that was supposed to be imposed on it. But it was just like these Bitcoin ETFs created and structured using the futures markets. And the futures contracts were rolled over constantly. It may have be, may even be on a daily basis. I can't remember how frequent the interval is. And so if you're someone who says, you know, I, I really uh, like the trajectory of the market. I want to I want to be long and strong and, and bet that things are going up. I don't want to just invest everything in stocks. I want to bet that uh, I, I want to invest in one of these two or three X levered funds. Well, I would say that a margin account borrowing money to buy the market and buy securities in the market is a it's dangerous but it's a far better way to go than to buy one of these levered funds because just like the bitcoin etf these futures contracts get rolled over and you get crushed as an investor when you hold before and after that that roll as they say now this might seem similar to the way that like bond funds are managed i'll, I'll get to that in in just a moment but the fact, the fact here is that the Bitcoin ETFs, the levered ETFs and mutual funds that are based on market indices or sectors of the market or, or, or some combination of the two can work great if you're trading intraday. And for some institutions, for some portfolio managers, for some people out there, that can make a lot of sense. 
But by and large, for the people who are going to be listening to this podcast, certainly for every single one of my clients, it does not make any sense at all to hold those things over long periods of time. Because when you do, you're just giving more and more money to the, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the traders and market makers who operate that exchange is really what it comes down to. Now, in the past on the podcast, I've talked a little bit about how bond funds are managed. And I would, again, I would say that the Bitcoin ETF out there, the, the, the few that I've, I, at least the two that I'm aware of, are a lot like these levered futures, mutual funds and ETFs. They're nothing like bond funds. The similarities here is when you buy a bond, like a 10-year treasury or a 10-year corporate bond, you buy one of these things for money out of pocket. Let's say you pay 10000 bucks for it. The issuer of the bond, the government, the corporation, or whomever, pays you interest usually every six months. And then 10 years down the road, that bond's going to mature. You get your money back and the deal's over. And when you buy a bond fund, either through an ETF or a mutual fund, there's a manager of that fund that always has these bonds maturing and coming off the books. So the bonds go away, they get cash in return, and they're being reinvested in new bonds at the prevailing uh, market rates at the time. And so it seems like you're rolling them over constantly, and that's that's happening, right? But it's it's totally different than rolling over futures contracts. That's the biggest difference. We're, we're, we're talking about uh, plain vanilla debt instruments, bonds that, that trade over the counter everywhere compared to futures contracts that can offer a whole lot of leverage and can really get you into trouble in uh, uh, a big way in not very much time. So there are some similarities in you know this, this process of a security in the portfolio coming off the books producing cash and which then needs to be reinvested in another bond or another futures contract. It just comes down to, are you buying the underlying security and holding it in trust somewhere? Or are you buying a futures contract that's, that's just betting on what's going on? Another analogy there, it's kind of like off track betting. You know, there's a horse race going on and you're betting on some race uh, that's occurring in Kentucky and you're sitting in Florida um, it's just a side bet and it can really get you in trouble if, if you're, if you're not careful with it. So I, I hope I made the point clear, but if you're interested in this cryptocurrency thing, um, it's, it's, it's been pretty wild over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm feeling pretty knowledgeable about it, but I'm by no means an expert, but if you're interested in it, just really think hard before buying one of these ETFs. It's, I can't think of too many circumstances where it would not be better, easier, more effective, far less costly, far more efficient to just buy the direct cryptocurrency through one of these wallets. It's an evolving thing. There, it comes with its own risks, but it's a far more direct path. So that's it for today. I hope this was interesting, but this, this concept of using the futures markets to circumvent the SEC's approval process. That's a bad way to put it. Let me back up. The SEC has approved these as well. The SEC has not approved the uh, ETFs that directly hold Bitcoin because of those trust issues that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. It's an interesting way to uh, produce something that the regulators will approve, but for most of us, it's really not a good idea. Um, but it's been in the news a lot. A lot of people are asking about it. Um, I would I would just think twice. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for tuning in and I'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.